Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Add Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio back with you again, fresh off our in-person event at Lucian Live. We recorded seven episodes with uh, thought leaders and users of Lucian uh, throughout higher education at the conference in Denver. We're tired, but we're here, and we're talking to great people time and time again here on this podcast. We're so humbled by our guests that come on and and, and come on to basically an unplanned, unscripted, organic conversation um, that uh, you have to be brave to come on to, especially when you know that I have weapons uh, called sound effects that I use, depending, you know, if you say something good or you say something bad, you get a sound effects that, that follows. But no, we like to have fun here at the Edup Experience, as you both know, um, uh, both my guests know and our audience knows. We're honored to have passed now 135,000 downloads of this podcast in our 420, 430 episodes. So it continues to grow like wildfire. Speaking of fire, I have absolute fire on with me today. Knowledge, I have passion, and I have two presidents with me, a former and current of an institution. I don't think there's anybody that's done anything like this before. So we're so honored that they're here today. Uh, the studio audience is ready. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I've got Dr. Aisha Francis. She's president and CEO. And wait, 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 crowd. And I have <laughs> Tony Benoit, president emeritus of Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Hey, guys, how are you? Hello. I'm doing well, good. thanks. That crowd thanks for having us. pretty closely, by the way. When I say stop clapping, it just cuts off, you know, just so you know. <laughs> um, Hey, guys, I'm, I'm so honored that you're here. Um, thank you for coming on the Edup Experience. I want to talk all about Benjamin Franklin Institute of uh, Technology or BFIT. Is that how you do you do BFIT at all? Or do you don't how the that? young young folks say it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's be fit. speaking of, of things being all about fit in your higher edu education journey, um, Aisha, I'm going to go to you first since you are the new uh, president of the institution. And I think, what, a year and a half now or so? Too. Yeah, so we, we can talk through that. We had a, a secession planning um, process. So I was a CEO for one year and then starting July 1 became president and CEO. Awesome. So let's just level set. Tell me about uh, uh, BFIT, if you will. What do you guys do and how do you do it? Absolutely. Well, we are, first of all, a, a technical college that is open access. Uh, with the goal of exposing as many people as possible to technical training and the trades. Oh, and well, thank you. <laughs> and we uh, are the beneficiaries of um, half of the estate of Benjamin Franklin, the founding father himself. So I think we have a, a, a very um, singular history that dates back to 1790. And um, we're really you know, proud of the work that we do and our outcomes. Um, but our goal is to get as much education in the hands of uh, as many people as possible to fill middle skills jobs. You know, uh, Tony, that's not always the goal of institutions today. Um, there's an array of institutions, elite, if you will. Um, there are open access institutions. There are those that are matching jobs uh, to skills, uh, degree, no degree. It's, it can be very confusing. And, sometimes limiting, sometimes a, a, an institution has to have a very defined mission of what they want to do, whether they want to be exclusionary or inclusive. And I think that's, um, to hear Aisha talk about it, I mean, I think you guys have sort of picked a lane. So uh, I agree with everything you're saying. I, I think that uh, education that is specifically aimed at jobs tends to get short shrift, that the people are, don't value it as much sometimes as education for its own sake. Now we value both it at Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Uh, the primary objective of every one of our programs is to get uh, the graduate into a good job. Uh, when, when we say good, we mean it's a job that pays well, that has opportunity for advancement, that's interesting, uh, that has you know, uh, good benefits and, and other positive things about it. At the same time, uh, we actually hear from the employers we work with that they very much value that our students come out educated as well as trained, that they, they have many of those qualities that we associate with education. The ability to do research, the ability to think, the ability to uh, give directions and to take directions, to communicate. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Well, I'm gonna get to that stuff in a minute, but I wanna, I, you know, I think a key thing to talk about here 
is um, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology had a very, um, let's call it a white uh, leadership team. And I, I don't know if it, th that's a PC way to say it, but that's true, right? Uh, a very white uh, leadership team. And Anthony Yu in bringing in uh, Aisha had said, you know what, we need to diversify our leadership team, um, you know, and reflect the time, so to speak. Um, can you talk about the succession plan a little bit, both of you, but I'll start with you, Tony. Yeah. The succession plan, the importance of uh, DEI in that succession plan and, uh, you know, preparing the university for the future. So when I stepped up as president back in 2014, uh, the senior leadership team had no people of color, which struck me as odd for a minority serving institution. And, and I don't think it was a, um, I don't think that it was an evil scheme. I think it was um, sort of unfortunate that, that the proper attention had not been paid to that. Um, we started paying attention to it and we had the opportunity to evolve the senior leadership team. And uh, when I, when I, when I went from president to president emeritus, the senior team was about two thirds, three quarters people of color, which, well uh, and, and it was a great team. It was a team that, that not only reflected the student body, but it was people who had uh, definite passion about what we do. Um, meanwhile, uh, I had the opportunity uh, during my time as president to bring Aisha in uh, as chief of staff and uh, so we worked very closely on a number of things, and it was very clear to me from early on that she had definitely had the talent, the experience, the passion, uh, and the um, expertise to, to lead the, ex the institution fully. And so as I was thinking about you know, what, what I might want to do next, there was a time when I thought, oh boy, I'm never going to be able to get away from this place. I'm never going to be able to step down. But uh, um, uh, when yeah, I started it, working with Aisha, I saw, oh yeah, there's definitely the chance for, for, uh, for new leadership. And uh, Aisha really, like I said, she had not only all of those things, the talent and the experience, but a tremendous vision uh, for what BFIT is now and what it can be going forward. And so uh, it seemed like a very, a very natural uh, transition for the institution. Fire. That's what uh, Tony just called you. That uh, Aisha, that you're fire. So you don't. I guess you don't get that job unless you bring the fire, right? So talk to me about what this means to you, how that, why you're so passionate about being a leader in higher ed, why you're so passionate, and I'm sure about representing people of color in higher education. Um, mm -hmm. There are not many people of color in the top role of president throughout higher ed. In fact, we've interviewed many on the Edup Experience, but it is not uh, as common as I think we'd all like it to be, and what that responsibility feels like to you now. Well, that's that's a um, a whole weighty um, <laughs> set of no questions. Said, no but one said I ask good questions here. I, you should just that I ask questions. <laughs> Many questions. Let me start here and say that I uh, come from a family of educators, uh, mostly K through twelve educators, and so I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I'm from, in um, an environment that really um, put um, college attainment um, as, as a possibility. You know, there are people in my family who did not attend college. There are people in my family who went to the military, folks who became electricians. There's a whole wide range of outcomes as there are in many people's families. But um, the point is that education was uh, first and foremost, that you would pursue something but beyond high school. And I think that expectation um, really uh, kind of um, resonated with me from, from an early age. The other thing that is just kind of in my bones, if you will, is this reverence, respect, and appreciation for minority serving institutions of all types. Uh, I graduated from Fisk University, which is an HBCU, um, founded in 1866. Um, of the people in my family who have attended college, 90% uh, of them attended HBCUs. And so it, it's um, knowing that Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology existed as a minority serving institution in my backyard, in my adopted hometown of Boston, um, was very interesting and exciting for me because I think there is incredible potential and um, uh, incredible relevance to institutions um, that allow people who 
tend not to have as much college attainment as others. They don't have to be minorities, but first generation college students um, that allow them to be the majority of, of the population. Uh, and we know that in many cases that leads to better outcomes. So th that element of what we do uh, at this college and the fact that um, we're a local institution, commuter college, that is really purpose built for the greater Boston community all drew me um, to, to uh, work at the institution. And uh, it was a, a great privilege. And that was uh, September of 2018. And I haven't looked back. But of course, you guys thought that it would be great to make this transition in the middle of coronavirus, right? Hold on tight. This is going to be a bumpy ride. So, you know, what, what, what? there's no time like the present, as they say. So, you know, you just go for it, right? You just make that, t Tony, you're like, hey, I think I can hand it over now. And, and it's the middle of a pandemic and you guys just get together and you go, yeah, now's the right time. I mean, how's that? Can you talk about the environment, Tony? Like, what does that look like? I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, so the, yeah, we, 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 of course did, you know, we, we participated in the pandemic like every other institution. Yeah. Um, and we also, um, in the spring of 2020, uh, a number of things happened. Um, one was, of course, we went to 100% uh, remote learning, which was a very interesting experience. I remember about a month or two before that, in a senior leadership meeting, we were having an argument whether, about whether a dozen online courses would be too many for our student mm -hmm. body. And then, of course, we went to, you know, 100 and 175 online courses by the end yeah. of March. And uh, it went uh, much more smoothly than we had thought. Um, the other thing that was going on was we were we formulated a new strategic plan uh, that spring, which was very interesting to do uh, in the midst of a pandemic. One of the things that came forward was that the type of education that Benjamin Franklin does, which is education that supports and promotes economic mobility, right? You can get a better job. That that type of education was going to be even more relevant uh, through and coming out of the pandemic. And interestingly, one of the things that we, were, we would have uncovered anyway in our strategic planning was the importance of that. Uh, and the importance of that broadly, uh, I think one of the most salient aspects of the strategic planning was we said, gee, we have a good thing here. We should make it more broadly available. We should make sure that uh, we're not, uh, we have a niche within higher ed. We wanna make sure that the niche isn't so narrow that there are people looking at us and saying, oh, that's not for me. Um, and uh, some of that might've been, the, you know, the particular programs we had, the way we were scheduling classes, various things about the way we were delivering services. So we, we really thought we need to do this in a way which is inclusive and as welcoming as possible. Um, so that, there was, there was change in the air. Uh, the other change that uh, we've been working on for many years is we are, the college is still in the same location where it started teaching in 1908. Mm. And it's not a particularly good location for the college in terms of uh, the, you know, a campus from which to deliver our services. Um, and so we have been thinking for years about uh, where we might do it that is more, um, sort of more in the heart of the neighborhoods that our students tend to come from. Uh, and we had the opportunity to, uh, to find a, a piece of property in a part of town uh, called Nubian Square, which is really, um, is really undergoing a, uh, a renaissance. And uh, very exciting, the possibility that the college would be part of that. So um, I, I had been involved in a lot of the nuts and bolts planning sort of to get us that far. And uh, Aisha was really good at, at coming in uh, with the great knowledge of a lot of the people involved in that renaissance and, um, and you know, that vision, that fire, really to sort of move the campus forward from there. So um, there was a lot of change going on um, not just the pandemic, but you know a lot of a lot of uh, things that had been in process for years were coming to a head, and it's that that suggested that uh, it was a great time for the college to kind of re, re, not reinvent itself, but sort of recommit itself. And uh, I was coming up on ten years uh, at the college, 
and um, you know, maybe maybe my fire was going more to the ember side of things, uh, <laughs> and uh, Aisha's was uh, was flaring up quite brightly. So uh, it seemed like a like a fairly natural transition to make. Yeah, and, uh, uh, Tony's probably going crazy in his office, right, Aisha? I have none to give. Talking about all you know how where he is, and uh, but and then you take over, and and so what does this look like? and feel like for you, Aisha, you step in now in the middle of pandemic, you're taking over through a, a defined succession plan. Yes. And so your preparation was there, but then it's like kind of getting the keys to the car. You can be in the passenger seat uh, all you want, but when you get the keys, it's a different experience. What, what happened? You know, tell Listen, me the story. Like, you know, it was, it was a stressful time. I mean, you know, Tony just explained four or five major ships that we were in the middle of as an institution. Meanwhile, you know, the ground is shifting under our feet every other week with um, this public health crisis. And as we've said, we are an institution that serves a uh, majority of our population are actually young Black men of color uh, and, and Latinos. So this population is the, the very one that's being most impacted, they and their families. So we're also experiencing uh, a huge um, decline in enrollment. The students who have remained with us are stressed out and um, have a, a tremendous needs. Um, most of our students are uh, extremely resilient, but this um, set of circumstances really tested uh, all of us, even, even folks who were, you know, had the most resources, let alone folks who are, you know, economically on, on the edge. So the, the things that helped us get through um, one, you know, Tony and I stayed in close contact. As, as I said, he was president emeritus, but, you know, really on call. Because I was chief of staff, I had a good sense of what I was getting into. Um, we had a, a wonderful uh, uh, transition uh, to, for a board chair persons as well, you know, from a very one steady hand to another steady hand. So that that was very helpful. And really setting expectations with the leadership team as well to say, you know, what things can we put on pause and, and what can fall away so that we were really, we had to make room for all of this crisis management. And that meant that we weren't doing business as usual. Uh, so that that shared sense of purpose, putting one foot in front of the other, you know, that's what helped um, me as an individual leader, you know, get through the, this tough period. Uh, but I also did, you know, in, in total, uh, feel prepared for what it is that I was taking on. Hey, everybody, head over to www.edipexperience.com our website where you're going to find all of the episodes that we've recorded categorized so that you can ensure that you're spending your time listening to the podcasts that are most important to you. You're going to see the reviews of our podcast, the shows in our network, our partners, and a section on starter episodes. If you're new to the Edup experience, listen to those starter episodes and get a feel for how the podcast has evolved over time and our impact in the world. www.edupexperience.com. What's the best piece of advice, Aisha, that Tony gave you before you stepped into the role? Is there something that sticks out, like, you know, get a get a cot because you're gonna be sleeping here every night? I mean, what was that? What was that piece of advice that stuck out to you? That still you use or you refer back to? Because um, when you have a mentor, there's things that stick, right? Is there anything that sticks in your mind that you still hold on to? What I appreciate about Tony is that his his sense of um, you know confidence and, and support in my leadership decisions and you know he um, has been consistent in saying essentially you know trust trust your gut you know go with your with your own uh, judgment and um, that that's important and it doesn't mean that you can't uh, ask questions or find a kitchen cabinet for yourself but ultimately. Um, you know, leadership presence has a lot to do with the cumulative, I think, um, impact of things that we've learned over time. And um, there's a way in which Tony has um, of not, not exactly answering the questions that you not, are, are sometimes asking, but that's purposeful because ultimately sometimes we already know the answer, right? It's, you just need to talk it through. And so I, I appreciate um, that as a takeaway of Tony's leadership style and also his support of my presidency.
You know what? That's a amazing, amazing compliment. And but but Aisha, I got to call you out because I asked you the same question before we started the episode, and you said Tony never gave you any good advice. <laughs> <laughs> There's me causing drama here on the internet. No, you never said that. I'm just making that up. Guys, I got I got to be honest. I um you know, podcasts can be boring sometimes and uh, this uh, edup experience is not, by the way. Uh, we do like to play games every now and then. I want to know if you guys want to play a game with me. I'm up for it. Yeah. I listened to a few of these before, so oh. I have some idea of some of the types of games. <laughs> I'm sure. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of Higher Ed Word Association with your contestants, Dr. Aisha Francis and Tony Benoit. And I'm gonna ask you guys, I'm gonna give you a word or phrase, and I want you guys to tell me the first set of thoughts that come into your mind. Don't give me back one word answers. Really elaborate on these things if you can, because it makes for a really boring game if you give me one word answers back. I am the one word answer person. Um, you guys are gonna give me the good stuff because you know more than I do. So uh, here we go. Um, Aisha, you're gonna go first since you're you're uh, you're on the hot seat, as it were, as a college president now. ROI. First of all, I think that uh, it's another term for uh, what is the point. <laughs> so that's what I think. What are we getting out of this? What's the what's the yield? And we should all be thinking about that for our students. Student centered ROI. That's what I think of when I hear that term about a uh, return on investment. Tony, ROI. Uh, ROI is, a, it, as Aisha said, very, very important thing that it is the question of what, what am I going to get out of this? Uh, BFIT has had the advantage, I think, for a number of years of having excellent ROI. Uh, it's very easy to, to demonstrate in, in simple terms, in terms of increase in, in wages, increase in salary. Uh, and it happens right on graduation. So it's, a, it's, it's not something that, oh, maybe someday you'll be glad you did this. It's, you know, the, the, the week after graduation, you're gonna have a better job. So it's always been a very concrete, very straightforward thing for us. Now, Aisha, I know you said that only the young kids call it BFIT, but I did hear Tony call it BFIT. <laughs> so I, I like that. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna take back what I said because uh, Tony, you are a very young kid. Uh, no, that's right. Thank you. Great compliment. Um, here we go, Aisha. Over to you. We're going to go with degree value. Degree value is, uh, it, to my mind, the ability for someone to connect the time and effort they're spending to uh, increase in income and a sense of, of also pride in their own accomplishments. So, you know, we measure our value in um, the earnings, uh, the, how quickly students are connected to jobs, and many of folks get jobs before they even graduate, and our graduation rates, which are you know, twice the national average for technical colleges, for two-year colleges. So, you know, to us, uh, it's well worth the, the investment, and to our students, it's worth the investment. Sidebar, what do you guys think about this whole anti-intellectualism stuff that's going on? You don't need a degree, degrees are worthless. You, I mean, this, this is a common conversation that's happening now. And this, you know, kind yes. of a sidebar question before I lose it. Well, you know, what I want to encourage and I wish um, we really centered more is that this is not an either or conversation that, that their technical education allows people to have a practical career focused post-secondary experience and receive college. So, you know, this is college and, and it could be a college credit bearing certificate that's nine months, or you can uh, move on into a, a two plus two program and, and be with us for four years. But, you know, I just sort of reject the binary um, that there's this choice between a, a very disconnected ivory tower experience and you know a hands-on learning that stops when you're 18. Hmm. Yeah, I, ahead, I agree with everything that Aisha is saying and I think there's another aspect to it there's another there's a sense actually which I agree with the people who are critical of college degrees as the standard of excellence and I think that on the one hand when you earn a college degree 
it is some evidence of your ability to stick with a project over an extended period of time, right? I mean, you can't, you can't get a college degree in a, in, a, in a day or a week or a month and you know, usually not even in a year. So it does speak to your ability to take on a large scale project and carry it out. Uh, unfortunately, even today, and certainly this has been true historically, a uh, college degree has been used as a tool to screen out people who aren't typically on the college track. And so there's a certain demographic uh, in America, which is white and you know, above the midpoint in income, uh, who are much more likely to have a college degree. And so if you say, oh, you can't do this job without a college degree, that's, that's kind of a, a sneaky way of putting other restrictions on who you're gonna consider for the job. And so in that sense, I think that we do need to, we do need to upset the apple cart. We need to look again to say, what are, you know, what is someone capable of doing? And, you know, you know, it's great to have a college degree, but if you say that's the only road to success, uh, the way college has been structured historically in the United States, you, you really are going to be creating some injustice with that. That's true, Tony. Yes. And, yeah, and thought... degree discrimination is a real thing. And uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a, to a detriment of our entire economy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find the, the, uh, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if the right term would be an oxymoron here, but it's like, you know, degrees don't have as much value. And then we do have lower economic populations where you can, if you do get a college degree, your, your earnings potential is much higher. And so we have people of color and we have those from lower dis, you know, disadvantaged backgrounds. And you go, should they, should they, meaning somebody who's from a lower economic background, get a degree if we know that degree can help them earn into the future? And then you have this noise coming from the other side telling the same person coming from a lower economic background that a degree may not be the pathway. It can get confusing, right? I mean, I feel like yes, it's really confusing for people to know which lane to pick when you're trying to create some level of generational wealth. It's like right. there's a lot of pressure in that decision. Yeah. And a lot and not much margin for error, frankly. Right. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot around that. I will dig into that in a minute. Let me go, uh, Tony, you get the third and final term here. Uh, strategic planning. Strategic planning, uh, of course, has the very specific meaning of the creation of a document called the strategic plan. And that I think I've been involved in that a number of times over my career. And sometimes it's a, you know, everybody gets to throw a slip of paper in the, in the, in the hat. And then we, you know, flatten all the pieces of paper out. You know, we put them end to end and put a, you know, a cover page on it, and that's your strategic plan. That's not a particularly helpful process. Strategic planning though, which is looking at who an institution is, what an institution does well, uh, and where, you know, what's happening around the institution and saying, okay, what's the right strategy that's going to allow our strengths to do the most good over whatever period of time coming forward, that's a very valuable strategic planning process. And you know that you can have a you can have a document called a strategic plan. And if that document outlines sort of what we know about our strengths as an institution and what we know about the environment in which we're we're functioning, uh, you know, locally and broader, um, then that's going to be a valuable strategic plan. In my experience, it's that's not always what, the way it's done, though. I mean, sometimes there's a little there's a little something for everyone in that plan, and they go on for page after page after page. And uh, you know, there may be no one who's read the thing from from beginning to end. Um, in our planning process, and I went through two sort of formal strategic planning processes uh, while I was president. We really did take the approach of sort of asking internally, asking externally. You know, who are we? What are we good at? And where are the opportunities? And the documents themselves were not, were not that important. What, the important thing was the strategy that came out of it. And I think that's, uh, that's very good. It, it's also, one last thing I'd say about it is, if you can't summarize your strategic plan in a sentence or a few sentences, it's probably, you probably have too much going on there, right? That you, you need to be able to say, this is who we are. And, and so knowing that, it guides your decisions day to day. We want to manifest this strength uh, in, in our environment for the benefit of our students and our other stakeholders. Yeah, the crowd agree with you. 100%. Um, <laughs> if you thought for just a minute, uh, Aisha, that you were going to get the same term, 
then uh, you thought wrong because I'm going to give you the last and final one here, STEM. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, this is a, a, a Tony saying. Tony always says, you know, Benjamin Franklin Institute is the T in STEM. And the T is often, um, you know, I think overlooked or misunderstood and, and it doesn't get as much shine. Um, and uh, we have the privilege of really delivering a variety of technical education programs that um, some of which are uh, lesser known, you know, than, than others, but all of which land people in really good paying jobs in, in two years or less. And, and that is an important constellation of training programs that we offer for folks in greater Boston. So that's what I think of when I think of STEM. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just listened to another episode of Higher Ed Word Association, and I would say that both my contestants have won today. Congratulations, guys. You've won nothing. You won <laughs> I was going to ask, what's my point? No. <laughs> no, you won no money. We have zero money here at the Ed of Experience podcast. Uh, a lot of passion and no money. Um, so, uh, so let's let's take a step back, guys, because I, you know what? It's so interesting to hear some of the responses. The reason I love running this, by the way, I used to do like favorite music. And I ask every guest, what's your favorite song, your entrance music? And I get great answers, by the way. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something really cool. I'm going to just give you a term and see what comes to people's minds. And I get these great conversations that come out of one word or a two phrase, you know, a two, a two word phrase. And, you know, we just talked about it this degree versus non degree. Should you advocate for a degree? Should you not? And it leads me to the point that you made, Aisha, uh, a few minutes ago, which was, your institution is serving a primarily uh, uh, African-American and uh, Latino population. And a lot of black men are not coming back to higher ed. In fact, it's been well-written now. Um, it's been hard to get uh, re-engagement. Wh what are you finding? You're getting people back back to school? Has it been hard? Is it, you know, what, what does it look like? So it, it is difficult, but it's always been difficult. And I don't know that it's harder than it was in 2019. What I think is that uh, once you have these precipitous drops in folks filling out the FAFSA, FAFSA and um, really committing themselves to a post-secondary option, and that's national, it is hard. It's going to be hard for us to, to really um, kind of turn that back on. And um, so what that looks like for us is that, you know, we have seen um, enrollment rebound and we have also seen um, outsized interest in trade education. So our HVAC and refrigeration program is growing by leaps and bounds. Our practical electricity program has a wait list. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things. I don't know if it's because of the infrastructure bill and so much focus right now on, you know, really rebuilding uh, America's bridges and roads that, but, you know, so that part of things is, um, hasn't been a heavy lift. I think for, for us, there's always the, the opportunity cost of the investment in education for very low income students. Now, so we continue to have a majority of our students uh, who are black and brown um, men. Uh, we welcome women, we welcome folks of all ages and all backgrounds, but that is who, who our demographic is. I think the affordability factor for a, a private nonprofit college um, is the difficulty and, and how we can you know, raise more funds, um, connect folks with work, our students are working anyway, connect them with jobs that allow them to keep their paycheck and then give them tuition assistance, not tuition reimbursement because that requires upfront money, but tuition assistance. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things right. that we're doing now. Wow. So be fit. Where do we go from here? Tony, you've passed the baton. What, what was your vision? How do you, how do you, you know, you and Aisha have probably talked a million times plus one. Where, where does the institution go from here? Oh, Tony, you take that one and I usually okay. would okay. you to add so, on to it. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, I mean, Aisha is um, <laughs> well qualified uh, to, to, to actually implement this, uh, not just to talk about it. But, you know, I see that BFIT is a 
uniquely valuable investment of time, effort, and, and maybe a few dollars on behalf of students uh, to, to really improve their earning potential, uh, really promote uh, improvement in, uh, in employability and, and in, in standard of living. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I think has, is already underway is very much pulling the two ends of that together, right? I'm someone sitting here, there's a job over there, getting those employers even closer to the students because uh, there's a lot of value there. The college needs to try to you know, get, uh, dip into that value to, to, to create the educational process. Um, and that's, a, that's not an easy thing to do. And it's something we've been working at doing for some time. Um, there's also the excitement of uh, building a new campus. And that is, you know, I, I was at another institution where we built a new campus and it, it's a huge amount of work. And uh, what I found was that we didn't really even appreciate the payoff until it happened, right? You can see drawings, but until you're actually walking through uh, the new space, um, you don't really understand the beauty of, of, of the physical plant uh, and the importance of it. And, and given that the college is going to be moving really into the heart of the population that it has served for a number of years, I think that's another really important thing. And, and a new building, this is true even, you know, even in 2022, the second year of the pandemic, uh, or actually we're into the, the third, third year now, the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, yeah um, it is still true that buildings mean something and that when people see the new BFIT you know, in their neighborhood, I think that's a very important statement about the value of education and the commitment of the institution uh, to the well-being of the people in those neighborhoods. Uh, Aisha, before you answer where BFIT goes from here, Tony wanted me to ask you a question. He, I spoke to him earlier before we started recording too, and he wanted me to ask you here live on the Edup Experience, what is the worst piece of advice he ever gave you? <laughs> no, he didn't really. I don't know where I'm getting these questions from. Somebody <laughs> Aisha, where, where does BFIT go from here? Listen, I think that um, the kind of ultimate um, North Star for us is to be a place that is known nationally for our success, educating and graduating on time, um, multiple population subgroups that folks consider quote unquote hard to serve. And we do that successfully. We've done that successfully for, for decades and more people should know about it. And, um, you know, there, that, that is an important um, set of, of successes, you know, um, that really can change the trajectory of lives for families and communities. And we're doing the work. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, platforms like this to shout that from the rooftops. Um, but that's, you know, I think the ultimate North Star for, for the college. Speaking of shouting up from the rooftops, I'm going to give you guys our two final questions. And you guys can pick who wants to answer which one. Um, uh, number one, what did we not say about BFIT? This is, I like to call this the plug the heck out of your school question. What did we not say about BFIT? What's coming up? What's the website? Where are you going? What are you, what programs are coming? Any events that are going on? Anything mm -hmm. you want to say? Yeah, and absolutely. The second, the second question is, what does the future of higher education look like? So you guys get to pick from those questions. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt the second question to you, Tony, but what's okay. going on at BFIT? What we didn't talk about is the fact that a lot of our programs are really centered around um, something that is so central to our, you know, existential um, existence, you know, which is climate change and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So we have an automotive tech program that isn't just about internal combustion engines, but, you know, hybrid vehicle technology and alternative fuels. Uh, we teach in our HVAC program, we teach heat pump installation, which is really important, you know, for transitioning off of uh, fossil fuel use. Uh, we have a renewable energy program um, that teaches uh, both solar and offshore wind technology. Our electrical engineering program is centered around power engineering and folks who are installing the grid. So that's an, a huge area of expertise um, for, for the college. And we, we got to have uh, more 
uh, people um, from local communities that are working in these green jobs. Uh, we just had our first in-person career fair in two years. Uh, we were packed to the gills with uh, about 60 companies. And yeah, uh, companies want to hire people right now and they cannot find. Exactly. People. About 60 companies in our building, hundreds of students. Man. And it was so wonderful to know that, look, people really do want to work, right? Because we we said, you know, come and they, they showed up. Uh, and to see the interactions happening between um, the, the corporations and, and the college students. And, you know, that's what we're known for. So, you know, for people who are looking to hire, uh, I hope they come check out our, our recent graduates. Uh, graduation is on May 13th, no, May 14th, sorry, that's uh, Saturday, May 14th. And, you know, that's also going to be in person for the first time in two years. So we're, we're looking forward to our new, new normal. Love it. I love it. It's kind of like uh, get your mind right, go to be fit, right? <laughs> you get, I love be fit. I love, I love it. It's like the coolest acronym for a school ever. Um, Thank you. Anyways, as I, get, as I lose my serious vibe for a second, uh, Tony, what's the future of higher education look like? Uh, so the, I think your, your, you know, the early um, associations you made there, that word association game, uh, it, higher education needs to demonstrate uh, its value. To people, and that I think is um, uh, very much in economic terms. At the same time, it needs to be it needs to be uh, providing the platform that brings the average person success, right? Not just the most academically talented people. That that corner of higher ed is going to do fine. I mean, that's I think in some ways that's not even all that relevant to the uh, to to the um, you know, the functioning of the American economy and the function of the American democracy. But, you know, America is changing as a country and higher ed needs to learn how to serve who Americans will be in the 21st century. And, and I'm hopeful that it will learn that uh, and that the, the question of value is very important. And then we need the last piece is, okay, I can see the value out there. Somebody's got to show me the path from where I am to there, right? And it's like Aisha said, um, it, it, it wonderful if, you know, in the long run, you're gonna earn a lot more money by getting this degree, but if there's no feasible path for me to continue to work while I'm, while I'm getting in school, I can, you know, I can take care of my children, I can take care of my family, um, I can um, find the time to do the work and I'm, I'm interacting in learning environments, which don't feel like a, you know, alien planet to me, that th those are all things higher ed needs to figure out. And that, so that's what higher ed is going to look like. It's going to look like an environment where uh, we are providing learning, which is extremely valuable. And we're doing it in a way that the average American and the average American is not you know, white upper middle class, uh, that it's going to be an environment which is supportive and welcoming uh, and familiar uh, to those people. Wow, that's pretty good. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna repeat everything you said and say that I said it, Tony. That was <laughs> okay, <good>. go for <laughs> it, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Aisha Francis. She's president and CEO, and Tony Benoit. He is president emeritus at the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Did you both have a good Edip experience today? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, great that we were on. Yeah, you've just Edipped.